Arthur Schopenhauer was born in 1788 in Danzig and died in Frankfurt am Main in 1860. There are a number of photographs taken during the last decade of his life, from which we derive our most immediate sense of the man. He looks unconventional and grimly determined, but the sparkle in his eye is that of someone vigilant, incisive, and capable of mischief, not altogether different from the persona which emerges from his writings. At the end of his life, Schopenhauer was just beginning to enjoy a measure of fame. His philosophy, however, is not a product of old or middle age. Although most of the words which he published were written after he settled in Frankfurt at the age of 45, it was in the years between 1810 and 1818 that he had produced the entire philosophical system for which he became celebrated. As Nietzsche later wrote, we should remember that it was the creative, rebellious energy of a man in his 20s which produced the world as will and representation. The mature Schopenhauer occupied himself in consolidating and supplementing the position he had presented in this masterpiece, which was, until very near the end of his life, neglected by the intellectual world. Independence of spirit is the trait most characteristic of Schopenhauer. He writes fearlessly with little respect for authority and detests the hollow conformism which he finds in the German academic establishment. But behind this is the significant fact that he was also financially independent. When he came of age in 1809, he inherited wealth which, with astute management, was sufficient to see him through the rest of his life. His father, Hendrik Floris Schopenhauer, had been one of the wealthiest businessmen in Danzig at the time of Arthur's birth, a cosmopolitan man committed to the liberal values of the Enlightenment and to republicanism. He left Danzig when he was annexed by Prussia and moved to the free city of Hamburg. Arthur had in common with his father a love of French and English culture and a horror for Prussian nationalism. The name Arthur was chosen because it was shared by several European languages, though the intention here was chiefly to fit the infant for his envisaged career in pan-European commerce. Later, Arthur felt he had also inherited his father's intense, obsessive personality. His father's death in 1805, probably by suicide, was a great blow to him. Schopenhauer received a broad and enriching education in school, enhanced by the travel and social contacts that his wealthy family made possible. Sent to France at the age of nine when his sister was born, he acquired fluent French. After some years of schooling, at the age of 15, he embarked with his parents on a two-year trip to Holland, England, France, Switzerland, and Austria. He saw many of the famous sights of the day, and at times was deeply affected by the poverty and suffering he witnessed. While his parents toured Britain, however, he was consigned to a boarding school in Wibbledon whose narrow, disciplinarian, religious outlook, a marked contrast to the education he had hitherto received, made a negative impression that was the last. This episode says much about Schopenhauer's character and upbringing. He was a seething, belligerent pupil who would not submit to the stultifying practices that surrounded him, and he seems quite isolated in his defiance. As his life progressed, it became clear that it would not be constructed around close relationships with others. He began to see company as like a fire at which the prudent man warms himself at a distance and resolved to be lonely even when with others for fear of losing his own integrity. He later wrote that five-sixths of human beings were worth only contempt, but equally saw that there were inner obstacles to human contact. Nature has done more than is necessary to isolate my heart that she endowed it with suspicion, sensitiveness, vehemence, and pride. He was prone to depression and confessed, I always have an anxious concern that causes me to see and look for dangers where none exist. His father was an anxious, exacting, and formidable man, very ambitious for his son. His mother, Johanna Schopenhauer, also from a successful business family in Danzig, was quite different. 
She was a lively, sociable person. She had literary aspirations, which culminated in a career as a romantic novelist, making her, during her lifetime, more famous than her son. She was a significant force in his life, but relations between them were never warm. In her marriage, too, as she herself wrote, she saw no need to feign ardent love for her husband, adding that he did not expect it. After Henrik Schopenhauer died, the independently minded Johanna was free to embark on her own career and moved to Weimar, where she established an artistic and intellectual salon frequented by many of the luminaries of the day. Arthur benefited from some of the relationships he established in the circle, notably with Goethe and with the Oriental scholar Frederick Majeur, who stimulated in him a lifelong interest in Indian thought. However, his relationship with his mother became stormy, and in 1814 she threw him out for good, never to see him again. By the time this happened, Schopenhauer had abandoned the career and business which his father had projected for him, and had found his way into the life of learning. In 1809, he went to the University of Göttingen, from where he was to move to Berlin two years later. He attended lectures on a variety of scientific subjects, having originally intended to study medicine, but he soon gravitated towards philosophy, where a significant philosopher played a decisive role in Schopenhauer's career when he advised him to begin by reading the works of Plato and Kant. Though Schopenhauer was, by any standards, a widely read and scholarly thinker, it is fair to say that his reading of these two philosophers provoked in him the fundamental ideas that shaped his philosophy from then on. The Hindu Upanishads, which he learned of through Frederick Majeur, were the third ingredient which he later blended with Platonic and Kantian elements to make something quite original in the world as will and representation.